So we're going to try and uh, end this session in an hour and then break and give people freedom to go outside. And then for anybody who's interested, from about 5.30 onwards, we're going to come back just for an informal session so people can kind of talk about you know, whatever's important for them, experiences they've had, stuff they did in their small groups, or discuss any issues. So it'll be just an open format for the last hour before, before we go to uh, dinner. And we're going to end this section with a, a beautiful uh, a, a chant. You'll find out what happens at the end. So the last mission I lived in in Kenya was a little place called Kipsarman, literally in Kalenjin meaning the place of the twins. And I took over this mission from a guy whom I regard as uh, the greatest missionary I personally have ever come across, Father John Gary. He was belonged to the same missionary congregation as myself, the St. Patrick's Fathers. And John had founded this mission years before, and now he was being moved to the Sudan. You know, our, our society had been asked to found a mission in the southern Sudan, and John was asked to lead that, that project. So uh, I, I took over from in Kip Saruman Mission, and there was a big, big party to say goodbye to John. He was an extraordinary individual. He wasn't just a, a pastor of souls, he was a, a, a farmer of farming stock in Ireland, and he spent a lot of time you know, working with uh, semi-nomadic people who were being forcibly settled into a, an agricultural lifestyle by the government who had no you know, background in agriculture whatsoever. They were nomadic pastoralists, and he's you know, teaching the methods of you know, growing their own food. You know, and he introduced even a cash crop, coffee, so he had a little coffee nursery where he grew seedlings and gave them out to people so they could grow coffee, which was the, the uh, second biggest foreign exchange earner for Kenya, was our, our coffee. So he was a man who catered to all aspects of the people among whom he lived. And they had this extraordinary going away party for him. And they came from all over the area uh, to say farewell. And they had a, an elementary PA system set up and a microphone set up and important people like chiefs and whatever were giving speeches and there was a whole bu bunch of people giving John gifts you know, a, a gift of a goat or a gift of a chicken or a gift of 12 eggs or a gift of maize cobs they were bringing up these gifts to him and you know, the important people were making speeches and then this microphone set up at the table where John was sitting and towards the end of the ceremony this young Tugan mother came up uh, with a little child at her breast and she leant into the microphone and she thinks she's just talking to John, but she's actually talking straight into the microphone. And she said to him in Tugan, more or less, she said, if you had breasts, I'd want you to suckle my baby. Yeah. That was probably the most, the greatest compliment I've ever in my life heard a woman offer a man. Wow. Yeah, this was her... Her, uh, her blessing on John and her gratitude uh, for what John had done in the area. So some weeks later, there was a big official mass in the diocese, you know, presided over the bishop, uh, by the Bishop of Nokuru, a guy called Raphael Essendingi Mona Nzeki, um, a, local, a local man. And uh, there's this great mass, you know, to send John on his way to the southern Sudan. Subsequently, John was captured in the Sudan by a bunch of um, rebels. The southern part of Sudan was seceding from the, 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 the rest of the country. And John was captured and frog marched for three months you know, through the wilderness. Luckily, you know, he, he lived and to tell the tale, and he's still alive today. Um, but I remember at that mass, the choir sang a song, and you've all, you all know this song. And there's one verse of that song that, for me, encapsulates you know, the whole topic of mission. And uh, if I can sing it, uh, this one verse, it says, Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you leave. I will hold your people in my heart. And I cried and everybody cried uh, singing that because that's who John was. 
you know, holding the people of God in his heart and being willing to go wherever he was needed in order to do that. But this wasn't just a song that was sung for John Gary in, uh, in Nukuru Diocese in 1982. It's the song that every one of you sang as you volunteered for incarnation to come down and to hold God's people in your heart. That's the only reason you're here. And I don't care who you are, any one of the 7.6 billion people on planet Earth right now, that's the only reason we're here. But for the vast bulk of us, there is total amnesia for what we volunteered for. And we're either sleepwalking our way through life or we're cursing our lot. Most of us are just sleepwalking or cursing the fact I can't believe I signed up for this or I was born into this family or this body or whatever it is. And so that's what I want to talk about in our last le session together, in the last lecture together. We'll be together tomorrow for Mass for God's help. Um, what, is, what does it mean by mission? What did you volunteer for? What was your understanding of why you were coming? And so I just want to introduce then initially the levels of mission. So I believe that each soul is committed to two very different levels of mission. There is the mission of the individual soul to grow into the fullness of your divinity and to be willing at some stage uh, to merge again with source. That that's the individual mission that every single soul is on. And then there's a group mission or a global mission, which is to come onto this little planet, this third rock from the sun, this boot camp of the Milky Way galaxy, in order to try to move the entire culture, the global culture, into Christ consciousness. So we have this uh, twin mission, individual movement into unity consciousness and unconditional love, and to move the entire process and the entire planet into a global Christ consciousness. So I think there are the two levels of mission. And we're given equipment for this purpose. And to kind of synopsize it very, very briefly, we're given physicality, emotionality, and intellectuality. They're the three most obvious kind of uh, resources that we have when we come down here. We're born into physical bodies that have particular abilities and particular limitations. We're born into a, a, a planet which we, in which we experience emotions. And this, I think, was Ingrid pointed this out very beautifully to us today. There are beings out there who are born into dimensions and planets in which emotions are not part of the equipment. You know, that's part of maybe why we're being experimented upon. You know, that people are fascinated or other civilizations are fascinated by what is it like, you know, to have emotions. You know, I don't know if any of you saw the movie because City of Angels, do you remember that movie ever? Who was it? Um, very... Oh, who was it? Okay, and who was the beautiful... There was a great woman in that. Meg Ryan. Meg Ryan. Meg Ryan. Yeah, that's the American remake. It was a German movie before. Okay, okay. Okay, right. Who was that? There was an actor then. Who was the actor that was on this? Nicholas Cage. Nicholas Cage. Cage. And there's this great story. The, the story backstory is Nicholas Cage is an angel who wanted to experience uh, being a human being, and so he's having all these unique experiences for the first time, including he wants to know what does an apple taste like, you know. And Meg Ryan doesn't realize that this guy is an angel incarnated, and she she went, "What do you mean? What is an angel?" What does a, you know, uh, an apple taste like? Well, he said, I don't know what it tastes like to you. And so he's trying to figure out what it's like to be a human being. And part of the experiment is he wants to know what it's like to experience emotions. And so part of our equipment is our ability to experience emotions. And that can be beautiful or it can get us in trouble. And the third thing is our intellectuality. You know, we all have this little three pound, you know, piece of wetware that we carry between our ears, and it's our computer for, uh, for our journey on planet Earth. And it's, it's not very complex, although people make this extraordinary claim, and it doesn't make any sense to me, that the human brain is the most complicated organism in the known universe. That, for me, doesn't, that, that's a totally fictitious you know, claim, that this little three-pound mass of wetware is the most complicated item in the entire universe. I don't believe it for a moment. But it's what we have to work with. 
So we got a physical body to work with, we got emotions to work with, and we got an intellectual uh, a brain to work with. And that's the equipment that we're given for this, for this job. Now, they're the, kind of, they're the most recognizable resources we have. But as I keep saying, you know, they're only actually three levels of a seven-tier you know, resource. It's where we start off with cosmic consciousness, the, the metacosmic divinity, you know, which is the source of all uh, that is. And then there's the kind of the second stage down is the individual soul. And then the third stage is the causal body, where we, uh, we still have our psychic powers. We're literally experiencing entanglement theory you know, at a, at a deep uh, psychic level. The fourth one is the mental body, the intellectual, the ability to raciocinate, uh, to mentate, you know, to think. Uh, and the third level of body, the, uh, the, the third level up and the kind of the fifth level down is the astral body, which is a very, very talented level of the self because uh, that's the place that our emotions actually reside at the astral body. You know, when we're having an emotional reaction, we're drawing energy actually from the astral body. It's also the place where we can experience out of body, you know, the situations which can happen either spontaneously or can be, you can learn how to do it, where you can temporarily, while you're still alive, disengage from your physicality and travel, where you're not subject anymore to space time or to causation, and where you create a reality which is very, very uh, totally independent of the sensorium. It's also the place that we, the body that we use when we dream. You know, and we can be anywhere, anytime as we dream. So we're all operating from the astral body. It is the place, the level of us, I believe, where we can encounter the deceased. Because they can come down, they can lower their vibrations sufficiently to meet us at that level, and we can raise our vibrations sufficiently to meet them at that level. It's very difficult for them to come all the way down because they have to really downgrade their uh, um, frequency into this density of the physical, although it something happens sometimes with kind of ghostly encounters. You know, and for us, we can raise our vibration from the dense physical to the astral, so that's the normal place where we're going to encounter the dead. It's going to be in dreams of the night or uh, kind of astral travel of some kind. And I think also it's the junction, it's the Chicago, it's the O'Hare Airport you know, of America. It's the place where all the, kind of, all the circuits meet here, all the planes uh, go through Chicago O'Hare. So the astral body is the Chicago O'Hare of the psyche where all of our parallel lives and whether you call them past, inc past incarnations or future incarnations, that's the intersection point where they all cross-fertilize with each other and we learn. And then the, the sixth level down is the etheric body, which is kind of the, uh, the blueprint, the um, a, a energy template, which finally results in our physicality. So that's actually the equipment for incarnation. We, we, kind of, uh, we work our way down through these uh, different levels. Now, as I said this morning, I believe then that personality is not just the dance of nature and nurture. It's not just how uh, genetics and environment you know, form personality. But, you know, it's rather nature, nurture and the soul. The three ingredients of personality, I believe, are the dance between our genetic code, our environmental, you know, uh, input from family and culture, and, but mainly from the, the soul who's activating the spacesuit. So it's um, uh, the personality then for me is the interface between the essence, the soul, and the environment and the genetic makeup of the spacesuit in which it finds itself. So that's by way of my introduction. So I'm going to divide the rest of this lecture then into two parts, the individual mission and the global mission. So part of our equipment then, part one, subsection A, uh, part of our equipment then is our emotions. Um, and I believe that all human babies are just born with two emotions. We're born with the ability to feel fear and we're born with the ability to feel love. And in the course of our life, these two uh, emotions dance with each other and they create all of the other virtues and vices. So when um, fear is interdirected, it becomes anxiety or depression. And when fear is out of directed, it becomes anger or even rage. So now it's birthed two uh, versions of itself, an inner version or an outer version. 
when love is inner directed it becomes self esteem we recognize our own divinity and when love is outer directed it becomes compassion and now you got four pieces to it so you got the inner and outer directed love and fear and they dance together and they create all of the other virtues and vices that we experience so i think then that uh, the 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 ultimate dance between love and fear is that an infant particularly as that reaches the stage of developing an ego and realizes the horrible realization that there isn't just a mother child complex of which i'm in charge we're two separate entities and she has all the power and then i start developing all these defense mechanisms to counter act the fact that i'm i'm basically alone i'm weak and i'm vulnerable and so the greatest fear of all is the fear of not being loved not only the fear of not being loved but of being intrinsically unlovable that is the greatest fear that every child has or every one of us has that not only are we not loved we are basically unlovable how could anybody if they really knew who i was how could anybody love me and very very often we go through life and this is the basic this is the basic kind of uh, um battle that goes on within us uh, learning to love ourselves and rec- to recognize who we really are and therefore learning to love everybody else and everything else because we recognize what they are so it is finally extinguishing all fear through unconditional love and ultimately love always wins out because even fear is a perverted form of love fear is the inappropriate love of self egoic attempt to protect oneself because of the fear that's at the base of it so ultimately in this titanic battle uh, at an individual level and at a global level love always wins out because it makes even fear realize that fear itself is actually uh, a contravention the the idea that i'm not lovable so when i realize i am lovable and i am loved eternally loved begotten of love and destined for love all fear dissolves at an individual level and at a social level and at a global level so that's part of our equipment then the our emotions are a very important part which is why again i agree completely with with ingrid that civilizations for whom you know emotions are not part of their equipment are fascinated uh, by the human species and life on planet earth beings who have uh, these emotions you know even though we struggle with these emotions and we dance between love and fear they're fascinated what must that be like what's it like to taste an apple what's it like to feel an emotion so that's part of our great equipment and then we come in bearing two kinds of gifts i believe the first kind of gifts are our talents and they are our gift to ourselves only in the sense that they provide us with what we need to be of service to the world no um so whether you're a, a great you got a great athletic body or you got great musical talent or you got a great um, mathematical brain you know whatever it it comes to whatever that talent is you know it is not it does not belong to you i use this image if you're a male man and you're going delivering mail and you got a bag in which there's 100 envelopes <coughs> even if the bag belongs to you even if you didn't get the bag from the post office it's your own bag and you got the mail inside in this bag you think that big because the envelopes are in the bag that the envelopes belong to you and they don't your job is to deliver the envelopes to the people whose names are on the envelope and so all the talents you have they don't belong to you god put them in your mail bag to deliver to planet earth now you're entitled to make a living from delivering the mail but you're not entitled to make a killing from it so it, it really upsets me to see occasionally such and such a basketball player just signed a seven year contract with the warriors for 21 million dollars i can't believe that anybody you know that anybody's talent is worth that much money to the individual who's carrying the mail bag you know so whatever it is you know we're entitled to make a living in and a decent living from the talents that we've come down with but we're not entitled to make a killing out of it yeah but they do not belong to us we're not meant to hoard them we're meant to give them to the people whose names are on the envelopes the second kind of gifts we come down with are our problems and these do belong to us these are the guarantee that we're going to have to stretch during incarnation and grow and learn 
And so very, very often what we do with our talents, we hoard them, even though they don't belong to us. And the problems we came down with, we project onto others instead of working with them on our own. So the stuff that belongs to us, we project and then get angry with others because we recognize in them what we fail to recognize in ourselves. And then we hoard the talents that we came down to deliver to the world. Uh, so we have to be really, really careful when we look at, uh, you know, how we've been equipped and how we are in the world to make sure that uh, we recognize our talents are meant for others. We are meant to be of service to each other and to the planet. And to make sure that we don't badmouth God our life for the problems we encounter, whether they're family dynamics, whether they're personal difficulties like dyslexia or, you know, whatever it is that I'm dealing with as an individual, this is the guarantee that you're going to have to stretch during this incarnation and grow into virtues, dealing with whatever fears you have or anxieties you have or family situations you have. These are a gift, you know, for you. So be really careful that you don't curse those things, you know, and hoard the other kinds of stuff. So then understanding now what your talents are, whom they're destined for, and what your problems are and what their function is, you know, and what your resources are for this. You know, what then specifically are you attempting to do? And basically, you're attempting to develop love in all its forms. Because you can, you can name any virtue, and I guarantee you, it is simply love in a different environment. In one environment, love is going to look like compassion. In another environment, love is going to look like courage. In another environment, love is going to look like trust. In another environment, love is going to look like forgiveness. In another environment, love is going to look like patience. You can take any virtue you like, and I guarantee you, it's simply love in a different environment, calling forth different aspects of itself. And you take fear in all its aspects. You take any, any vice, and every vice is simply fear in some version of itself. Anger is just a version of fear. Anxiety is a version of fear. Xenophobia is a version of fear. Prejudice is a version of fear. You know, they're all just versions of fear. So our basic job then as an individual mission is to learn to love in all circumstances, develop all forms of love and overcome all forms of fear. So they are the twin poles of the individual mission, to learn how to overcome all forms of fear as we experience them and how to develop all forms of love as we encounter them. So. We volunteer then, every soul volunteers to come to parachute into a lifetime that affords the ideal circumstances for learning a new kind of love, you know, and learning to overcome a new kind of fear. And so we choose bodies, and we choose families, and we choose an era, and we choose a culture to, into which we're parachuted that will optimize the, those possibilities for ourselves. So, um, it becomes really important then to realize that the hand you were born with is precisely the hand you planned before you incarnated. It wasn't good luck or bad luck, you know, it wasn't, you know, you weren't thinking properly or straight or life sucks because you were born into this family or this stage, whatever. You were born precisely with the hand that you planned before you came. And for me, that's the ultimate meaning of karma. Karma is not a punitive mechanism whereby I'm being punished in subsequent incarnations for stuff I did in previous incarnations or in subsequent periods of my life for stuff I did at er earlier stages of my life. Karma is the realization that I was born with a hand I planned before I came. And so that's what karma means as far as I'm concerned. That's the real meaning of karma. Then destiny you know, and often these things are confused. Destiny and karma and fate are often conflated. They're very different. Karma is that you're born with the hand you planned before you came. Destiny is the place you're meant to arrive at if you play the hand you planned, the way you planned to play it. So you, you, you plan this hand, you're born with this hand, that's karma. Now, if you play that hand the way you intended to play it as a soul as you came in, your destiny will be the result at the end of this lifetime you reach the destiny that you hoped for by planning this particular hand. Faith is what happens when you don't play it the way you were meant to play it. Faith is what happens, it's the outcome, when selfishness takes over, 
when you uh, camp out at the service to self end of the spectrum, uh, developing greed and avarice and anger and violence and warfare. You know, fate is who you become at the end of that uh, because you didn't play the cards that you planned the way you planned to play them. And then you go into a bardo state and you sit down with your mentors, your heavenly mentors, and you say, OK, let's do a life review. How do you feel you did? And you say, yeah, I can't believe it, I fell asleep at the wheel. I totally forgot why I was down there, you know, and I camped out, you know, on the service, service to self. You know, I, I wish the guy, I'd wake up, you know, send me back down there. Give me another chance to do this. And we, give, we, get, we get as many chances as we want. And so we come back in hoping that I have now adjusted my sights, I have now uh, tweaked uh, the hand I want to be born with in order to try to make up ground for the stuff I didn't learn, I forgot about in the previous one. So that for me is, uh, that's, the great, um, that's the great personal mission that every single one of us is on. And there's no judgment whatsoever. At no stage are we sent to a hell at no stage is somebody going to wave a finger in their fa face and say, bad boy, bad girl, you screwed up here. You know, there's just, okay, let's do a life review. And the beauty of the life review, when you talk about people with people who have had near-death experiences, you know, is that you're not being judged by anybody, not even by the mentors who prepared you for this lifetime and are kind of debriefing you at the end of this lifetime. There's somebody want to find out, how do you feel you did? But there's this extraordinary mechanism. It's not that they're asking you to recall stuff and say, oh God, yeah, I remember I screwed up there. You know, you actually get to experience every single significant event in your life from the perspective of everybody involved in the event. It's not that I'm saying, for instance, I wonder what Yanina was feeling you know, when I said that to her. It's not that. I experienced it as Sean in the encounter and I experienced it as Yanina in the encounter. And so I get to experience all of the perspectives of all of the players in all of the events of the incarnation just finished. Again, there's no judgment here. It's just, okay, now I appreciate the repercussions of what I said or what I did. Okay, let me go back. You know, I want, with that new information and that new insight, I want to see if I can make a better fist of it this time around. And we come back again and we fall asleep again, mostly. Or we curse our luck. Can't believe I was born into a, a handicapped body, you know, into this family. Why couldn't I have been born into Bill Gates' family and got a proper education and have my own personal yacht? So, you know, we've, we fall asleep at the, the wheel again. So that's kind of part one of the mission, the individual aspect. The second part of uh, the mission, then, is the global aspect. What we're meant to accomplish, you know, not just as a tribe, uh, not just as a community, not just as a family, not just as a nation, but as a species, as homo sapiens sapiens. Um, and it becomes really important then to realize that in the evolutionary trajectory from our early ancestry, from starting off as single-celled amoebas uh, to multicellular creatures, to sea creatures, to amphibians, to you know, reptiles, uh, to mammals, uh, to hominids, to homo sapiens, to homo sapiens sapiens, whatever. There's a, a national, there's a natural evolutionary trajectory based on the intelligence of the organism that the soul is operating out of. So the intelligence of a mammal is very different from the intelligence of a reptile. And we have both parts of that in our equipment. We have a reptilian brain, which is totally dedicated to survival and you know, self-propagation. We've got a mammalian brain that has emotions, and we've got a neocortex, which can think and symbolically create language. We also have an animal incest, uh, ancestry, you know, where we came at some stage, we were, you know, we were reptiles, literally reptiles. We were amphibians, literally, at some stage. We were sea creatures at some stage, and we carry some of that uh, with us. And so in that evolutionary trajectory, for a, lo a lot of that period, uh, might is right. The strongest or the swiftest are the ones who dominate. And so for millions and millions of years, the, 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 the planet was owned or controlled by dinosaurs, the mighty Tyrannosaurus rex, because of its huge size and jaws and whatever. It was the dominant species on the planet. So for a long period of time, uh, might is right. The ability of having physical strength or uh, prowess, uh, it gives you the right to dominate all of the species. And we're coming to the end of that period. We started off in the human journey with that same mentality, might is right, the strong guy wins. 
the guy with the biggest cudgel, you know, can grab the food source and beat the head out of people who, uh, who used to have the food that I now stole from them. And so, in some senses, the patriarchy is a, a state-specific, era-specific, you know, appropriate way of doing life on planet Earth. It, it, there was a period of time when that was the appropriate way uh, to decide who was in charge of what. And unfortunately, there's still a very strong residue of the patriarchal system uh, as individuals and individual cultures, and our, our own culture, that any culture that creates um, an empire and that uh, steals the resources of other cultures are still operating from that old patriarchal mindset that says might is right. Whoever has the most nuclear bombs gets to decide who owns the oil. You know, are the the mineral resources. So we're at the tail end of a, a patriarchal movement. Now, it becomes really, really important for us how we navigate the movement from patriarchy, because if we simply go into a matriarchal society, that's not going to solve our problems. There have been matriarchal societies. When you study anthropology, there are matriarchal cultures, and when you study them, they all practiced some form of slavery. So the idea that if we could just put all women in charge of everything, that we'd live in this idyllic situation, that's very simplistic thinking. Matriarchal societies have practiced slavery. So it's not, you know, we go now from a patriarchal society where physical strength, you know, gives us the right to dominate to a matriarchal society in which emotional lability gives us the, ability, the right to control society, where if you're really, really careful in our global mission, that is not what this is about. This is not about the, uh, the oscillation between physical strength, you know, uh, being wrong and kind of emotional ability uh, giving us the right to dominate anybody else. So patriarchy was an appropriate stage of the evolution of our species. It's shot its bolt long since we need to move and to evolve beyond that. But becoming angry at the patriarchy is the same thing as getting angry at a, an eight-month-old baby for pooping in his diapers. It's the very same thing. That's all the child knew how to do at age eight months. That's all the human species knew how to do by way of controlling, you know, and living I I between cultures. That's the only way we knew how to do it. Uh, it's long since outlived its usefulness. But the transition has to be a transition that's mediated by uh, forgiveness, and by love, so we move into the next phase. It's a waste of time to be angry at the baby for pooping in his diapers, and it's a waste of time for being angry at the patriarchy as we move into the next stage. We're wasting our time and our energy, and moreover, we're simply creating a morphogenetic field of anger into which the next stage is being born. Yeah? So you're going to born the next stage, into a, a, a field of anger and violence and then presume that it's going to be a peaceful, loving society, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So replacing an outdated, and it is outdated, domineering patriarchy with an angry, reactionary, reactionary matriarchy is simply the swinging the pendulum of violence from one gender to the next. It's not going to get us anywhere except into further violence. So... Um, it, this, for me, is one of the great insights of reincarnation. That every single male in this room was a female in a former incarnation. And every single female in this room was a male in a former incarnation. So whatever gender you're operating out of right now, it doesn't make any sense to be angry or prejudiced against the other gender, because you were there. And when you were there, you were equally prejudiced against the, the, the crowd, you know, in whose gender now you're walking. You're in a male or a female spacesuit. You were in the other spacesuit at some stage. And if you weren't a really developed soul, you were angry against the guys in the other gender. And also you swapped genders and you just swapped you know, targets for being an angry person. So it becomes really important to realize we've been in all these places before. The trajectory should be taking us out of this oscillation between gender identity and between anger at patriarchy or matriarchy. Because it leads to what I call Hatriarchy. This oscillation just results, uh, results in extraordinary violence. So again and again and again, as I study world history, and as I've had the opportunity of living on three different continents, you know, with many, many different cultures, what I see is that the slow, measured, love-driven change 
is the only one that transforms. Rapid, anger-driven change just swaps one tyranny for another. So that is the way the, the, great, the great teachers among us have realized this. Gandhi realized that. Mother Teresa recognized that. The Dalai Lama recognized that. Martin Luther King Jr. recognized that. That if you attempt to overcome a very corrupt regime violently, you become a violent person in the process, and you realize that the way to gain power is through violence, and therefore the way to maintain power is violence. And unfortunately, I see this in human history. And because I lived in Africa at a time when a whole bunch of African nations were wresting their independence from colonialist regimes, I got to see what happened. You had guerrilla fighters, or what the uh, colonialists called terrorists, because they're always terrorists, you know, when they're working against us, you know, but we're justified in the violence that we visit upon them. But every, every African nation that, that wrested its independence violently from colonialist regimes very quickly went through civil war thereafter. You go back throughout human history, the very same thing happened in all the other countries of the world, my own country. We got our independence from Britain in 1922, and within months there was a civil war that brothers who were literally you know, fighting together with guns side by side, uh, throwing out the British, were now pointing their guns at each other. And we had a really bloody civil war in Ireland immediately following upon our independence. In our country, we managed to delay that process about 100 years. We got our independence in 1776 by the 1860s. You know, um, uh, over 650,000 Americans had killed each other. And now the thing was, it was a very important issue. It was the issue of human beings owning human beings, whole slavery. It was a very justifiable issue. But the way in which it was resolved led to the death of 650,000 Americans. And it did not resolve the issue. 100 years later, in the 1960s, in our lifetime, Martin Luther King Jr. was left with trying to really, you know, finish this project. And he did it without ever speaking an angry word. He did it without ever, ever holding a gun in his hand. And he was assassinated for it. This, he wasn't just the victim of some crazy. He was assassinated because he was, it was too upsetting to the regime or the oligarchy or whatever, this kind of change. The fact that you immediately empower a whole segment of the population, this is too much, too quickly uh, for some people. And so Martin Luther King Jr. was taken out. And Gandhi was taken out for the same kinds of reasons. And so uh, these people know that it is the, it is the slow, measured, love-driven changes that last. And any anger-driven, you know, rapid change only creates violence. And so as we move from patriarchy into the next stage, we have to be really, really careful of the way in which we do it, and the pace in which we do it, and the energy with which we bring to the task. When I look at, for instance, the two most important people in the life of Jesus, uh, Mary, his mother, and Mary, his companion, Mary of Magdala. And I watched those uh, two women over the course of Jesus' public ministry, and particularly over the last three days of his life. And I watch the abuse that's heaped upon this prophet, this avatar. And I imagine not what it's like for Jesus to encounter that kind of rejection and that kind of violence and that kind of physical and mental torture that he went through. I can only imagine what it was like as a mother to watch her child you know, be subjected to that and watch the Magdalene, you know, his beloved, his companion, experience that and wanting to kind of scream in the face of the high priest, how can you do this to my child? Or say to Pilate, how can you make this kind of judgment against him? Or to the mob, how can you scream against somebody who raised your, your dead sons and daughters from the dead and who fed your hungry and who healed your lepers? How could you do that to my son or my beloved? They didn't. They watched, and they waited, and they forgave. And the Jesus movement was born. No matter how we corrupted in the interim, a Jesus movement was born, which for almost 300 years operated totally out of love and out of forgiveness. Because these two women had the ability to birth and to midwife this young movement, not through anger, not through vengeance, 
but through forgiveness and through love. So a part of our global mission at this stage, as we transition from patriarchy into the next stage, whatever that's going to look like, we have to be really careful. There's a, there's a modern movement, and I don't know how much traction it's, it's getting at this stage, but it's a very dangerous precedent. And if we're really serious about a global mission of transitioning our world into a, a Christ consciousness, we have to nip this in the bud before it gains any further traction. And it is the demonization of the male, the demonization of masculinity per se. It is the message that we're giving to our young boys that it is a sinful thing to be born into a male body. Now, I don't know how much traction is gained, but I, you know, I, I, I don't have a TV, I don't watch the news, but I'm hear, hearing this, that there is some kind of a movement in which the male is the enemy, and particularly the white male is the demon, you know, and that we must totally disempower the males or the whites, whatever, you know, and somehow empower uh, minorities, self-described victims sometimes. And that, that's the moment. That's a very dangerous precedent. Because two things are going to happen. You're going to have two terrible consequences if this were to gain any kind of traction. The first one would be the emasculation and the feminization of our sons, who will then grow up with a wretched, shame-based, guilty self-image for the crime of being born into a male body. We're going to create a whole generation, and maybe even several generations, of young boys who will be totally shame-based because they had the kind of the lack of foresight to be born uh, as males. And the second great consequence of it will be that there will be an angry, reactive, over-masculinization of those men who refuse to be pigeonholed and downgraded in that process. And now you're going to get this, the, the civil war to end all civil wars. The male and the female genders making World War III at each other. So we've got to nip this tendency in the bud as we move beyond patriarchy, as we've done in a really loving fashion. And as I say, uh, the realization of reincarnation, that you were in all the other positions, that that realization should temper whatever reaction you're having you know, to the other side of the equation. So I believe that anybody who is reacting really, really angrily uh, to the opposite gender is a very young soul who's forgotten very quickly that they were in exactly the opposite position, maybe even in their last incarnation, you know, and were equally angry and equally prejudiced against the gender that they now hold for themselves. In fact, I would make the claim that you know, over subsequent incarnations, every single one of us has been born into different genders, different races, different ethnic groups, different socioeconomic statuses, uh, different, uh, having different IQ levels, having different talent, talents, so that anybody who's jealous of, prejudiced against, or angry at any other group of people whom you define by whatever category you choose to define, that anybody who's operating in life with that kind of uh, re reaction and response is a very young soul who's forgotten very quickly that very recently they came from that class, or from that race, or from that religious affiliation. And so there has to be a place beyond this. So that's kind of subsection C here. I call it from, from gender to androgyny to soul self. Uh, there's a place beyond patriarchy, and there's a place beyond matriarchy. There's a place beyond being male, and there's a place beyond being female. There's a place beyond masculinity and a place beyond femininity. So, you know, androgyny is a stage in that process. Androgyny is the combination of two Greek words, andro meaning the male, and gyne, like, like uh, gynecology, meaning the female. And so it's the effort to try to incorporate the, the, uh, the, the gifts of both genders into the, into the one personality. It's a movement to develop both your male side and your, and your female side. And uh, yeah, so the best articulation of this for me is to go beyond the terms male and female or beyond masculinity and femininity and to employ uh, the Tao Te Ching, the terms yin and yang. Because uh, yin does not mean you're a female and yang does not mean you're a male. Yin does not mean you're a good guy and yang does not mean that you're a bad guy. Yin and yang is something that, that moves through every individual person. You have yin qualities and you have yang qualities. 
Sometimes it's appropriate to be more yin in your reactions and sometimes it's more appropriate to be yang in your uh, reactions. Uh, so this is a line that runs through every single one of us in incarnation. Um, so I've used the example a few weeks ago in a homily I gave on this topic. You know, imagine a big burly fireman who's called to the scene of an inferno. And there's a screaming mother outside who just went out to the back garden to do some gardening and the house caught fire and her little infant is inside in the back room in this uh, towering inferno. And left her on devices, she'd rush back in there and they're holding her back. But there's this big burly, you know, uh, first responder who braves the flames and the fumes and battles his way in. And the mother has told him exactly where the child is and he battles his way in and he grabs the child. Now he's operating completely out of yang energy which is really, really appropriate. This courage of the yang. And he goes in and he grabs the child. Now, he has to get out of the yang energy really, really quickly once he finds the child. If he's still in yang energy, and he casts the child by the leg, and he drags the child across the ground like it was a, a, a water pipe, you know, that, that, that's not appropriate at that stage. At this stage, he's going to have to get out of the yang energy, pick up the baby, hold it to his heart, so the little infant can literally feel his heartbeat He's going to go into yin energy for the return journey out of that inferno. Every single one of us has those two capabilities. So it's only a question of when is it appropriate to uh, behave in a more yin fashion and when is it appropriate to behave in a more yang fashion. So to, to misidentify yin as being female and yang as being male, that's a total misappropriation of these qualities. They both reside in every single one of us. It only means that particular situations call for a preponderance of one type of energy over the other. And so androgyny in some senses is a movement, it's a kind of a penultimate stage in the movement beyond gender completely. Uh, we're born into male or female bodies, but we cannot identify with that. That's just a resource just like we're born into a race or we're born with particular talents, we cannot identify with those. We can use those, but we can't identify with those. And so these are just stages. So there comes, there comes a time then when the soul has outgrown all of its illusions. It's outgrown all of its separate self-senses. Yeah, with, you know, um, with its body or its emotions or its gender or its socioeconomic status. And it realizes that it's a bite-sized piece of God who volunteered for an incarnational experience. And you wake up and realize at some stage, you volunteered to be here now. Bon voyage. So I'm going to hand over the microphone to uh, James Artemis and... Uh, Annika. Sean uh, asked, um, caught us singing in the chapel. <laughs> <Was he? laughs> we were busted. Um, and and asked, uh, asked that we share this um, chant that um, I uh, learned. Um, I was at a meditation retreat recently, and we would sing this uh, at the end of the last meditation of the day. And it's... Um, it's a mantra that's uh, in devotion to one's teacher, but it's also in devotion to the Universal Mother. Um, and so I'll um, just read the, the translation before we sing it. Um, it's called Twa Meva, and if anybody knows it, please sing with us. Um, so Twa Meva, you are my mother, who nourishes me with divine love and graces my life with self-respect. Chapita Twa Meva. And you are my father who protects me and instills in me the precious qualities of higher mind. Twa Meva Bandushya Saka Twa Meva. You are my true relative, my best friend, my eternal companion and dearest confidant who will never leave me. Twameva Vidya, you are divine wisdom, the essence of everything I know, all I am learning, and that which I do not know, but seek to understand and realize. Dravinam Twameva, you are the highest wealth and the bestower of all good things, all we require for our physical sustenance, wisdom, and liberation. Twameva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva, 
You are everything to me, the core of my being, heart of my heart, the source of myself, the soul of my soul, the ultimate reality devoid of duality and partiality, immutable, immaculate, indivisible, universal divine mother. Twameva Mata Chapita Twameva Twameva Bandu Jasaka Twameva Yeah. 